Okay, so I was taught in seminary and when I was growing up, some of the churches. In Genesis chapter 6, it says, The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and each one chose which one they wanted, and there were giants in those days. And what that means is, what I was taught that means is, is that the people on earth, the godly people on earth, intermarried with the angels in heaven, and there were giants. And that's what I was taught, and that is the greatest Greek theology you've ever heard in your life. It's wonderful if you believe in Greek theology. However, it isn't true. Today what we're going to study is what the Bible really teaches about that. This is the craziest passage you've ever seen. In Genesis chapter 6, it says, now we're going to be in Genesis chapter 4, so don't get to 6 yet. In Genesis chapter 6, it says that they intermarried and there were giants in those days and also afterwards. And then it's going to talk about this worldwide flood. And it's the craziest chapter you've ever seen. There's stuff that we haven't thought about. We're going to be studying this starting next week in Sunday school and we're going to go real in-depth in it. But we're going to go real in-depth this morning in Genesis chapter 4. How in the world did all of these people, Adam and Eve, and these millions, possibly billions of people on earth, Get down to one Christian family. There's just one family of believers. After you've got Adam and Eve, way over here, way over here, 1,600 years earlier, you've got Adam and Eve. Now, what year is this? 2000 what? <laughs> Some of you go, wow, I thought it was still 17. You've got 2,000 years to go back to Christ. That's longer than it was from Adam and Eve to the flood. 1,600 years from Adam and Eve to the flood. So you've got Adam and Eve, and they're having all these kids, and you've got, after uh, Cain kills Abel, you've got Seth, and then they're still having kids, and you've got these Christian families, and then all of a sudden, 1,600 years later, you're down to Noah and his family, and you've got one believing family that gets on the ark, and everybody else is non-believers. How did that happen? That the whole world lost Christianity and you've got one family of believers here. And what we're going to study today is how that happened and what we can do to keep it from happening. In fact, God has given us the resources not only to keep it from happening, but to win. God has given us the resources to be excited. God has given us the resources to be ecstatic about this stuff. And it's fun, it's exciting, and it works. Now, in Genesis chapter 4, this is, it's pretty easy to find. It's the first book in the Bible, and you go 1, 2, 3, 4. So everybody turn there. Genesis chapter 4. And what you're going to read today is the Cain's family. Cain's family. Remember Cain who killed Abel? Adam and Eve's son, okay, this is going to be Cain's family. This is going to be the ungodly line. What happens to believers when they don't follow Christ? And you're going to have an ungodly line here. What happens to parents when they don't follow Christ? You're going to have ungodly children. You're going to have unbelieving children. You're going to have a family that's just a mess. Then you get to go to chapter 5, and you're going to read about Seth and his family, this is a believing family, and you're going to read about all his kids, and this is the godly line. You're going to read about, and we're going to look at in just a minute, all of those marvelous people that you know. How many of you know about Methuselah? You may not know anything about Methuselah, but that he was old. Yeah. But he's in chapter 5. So you're going to have the godly line in chapter, I'm sorry, the ungodly line in chapter 4, and then you're going to have the godly line in chapter 5 and they are living side by side Genesis chapter 6 tells you that the sons of God in other words the believers they got to looking over at the ungodly line and those girls were beautiful and they got to intermarrying they were also lost they got to intermarrying and by the time you get to Noah, they've intermarried so much and there's so much confusion, there's no believers left except for one godly family. And it tells you how you get, how you get there, what happened there. 
In Genesis chapter 3, all the way over here, it tells you that Adam and Eve ate the fruit. And when Adam ate the fruit, what happened was, see, I used to believe that we lived in a good world, but we let Satan in, and we have to fight against him. And he's trying to destroy this good world. But what happened was when Adam ate the fruit, Adam surrendered according to what we've been studying. Adam surrendered what God gave him. Adam betrayed what God gave him and turned it over to Satan. And we don't live in a good world. We live in a fallen world. We live in a really bad world that has taken the characteristics of Satan. And this world has the characteristics of Satan in it. And now we're fighting to take it back. And what God is doing through Jesus Christ and through His family and through His believers and through His church is a counterattack. You see, they've got it. What you see in Joshua when they come back to take the promised land, as God gave it to Abraham, they lost it and now they're trying to take it back. And Joshua is a perfect picture of what's happening with us. So we live in a fallen world. We live in a bad world. We live in a world that... That the major characteristic of it is Satan. Satan is the father of lies. We live in a world that lies. We live in a world of death that kills. Why do we see what's happening in schools? And where is God in all this? And why did he allow this to take place? God gave this to us. And we surrendered it to Satan. And that's why it happened. And what do we need to do in our families to put a stop to this? And so in chapter 4 of Genesis, this is where we're going. In chapter 4 of Genesis, God is going to tell us what we need to do to not only succeed, but to win. And to retake our families, and to retake our countries, and retake our cities, and retake our churches. And it gets really exciting. Now, Adam knew his wife. She conceived and she bore Cain and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. And then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And also, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord had respect to Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance was fallen. Cain was what? Now, who is Cain? Cain is the son of? Are Adam and Eve believers? Yes? And, and they walked with Jesus, and Jesus walked with them, and they were believers, and yes, they sinned, but God killed a, an animal, I think it was a sheep, clothed them in sheepskin, and, and he took care of them. Now, they got kicked out of the garden, but they were believers. Who is Cain? He's the son. He's the firstborn son of a family of believers. But what's, what's going on with Cain? What's, what's with Cain here? Verse 5, what's with Cain? What's going on here? Verse 5. Cain was very what? Cain was very angry, and his countenance was fallen. Countenance is your, your face. It shows your personality. Now... If you want to know about your countenance, just look up here. What about my countenance? Ugh. What about my personality right now? Ugh. And see, his, he was a son of believers, but his countenance had fallen. His personality had changed. Now, this is the million-dollar question right here. Next verse, God says, God says what? Why are you so angry? And? Why is your countenance fallen? Why does your face look like that? Why has your personality changed? You see, you were raised better than that. You're raised by believers. You had God in your family. Why has your personality changed? What's going on in your life? What's going on in this family's life? Now, we're going to have to watch this because 
If we don't get this question answered, bad things start to happen. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Who's knocking at the door? And it's, his, its desire is for you. But you should, you should, you should, you can, you should rule over it. You should not let this thing have possession of you. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and did what? Oh, this is not good. Now, I've wanted to kill my brother before, but I didn't. Any of you got brothers and sisters? Any of you got little brothers? Oh, my goodness. I came out one day, and my little brother was mad at me, and he'd taken one of my golf clubs, and he was out beating the side of my car. I came outside because I heard this noise. Bam! 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 And he had my golf club, and he was beating the side of my car. Well, I rushed upon him. Now, he's 10 years younger than I am. I rushed upon him, and I tackled him, and I was just about to kill him when my mother came out and she yelled, put that golf club down, because <laughs> I was going to use it on him. Okay, now, Cain killed his brother. This is a Christian family. How could this happen? <laughs> well, if you've got little brothers, you know. Or you've got little sisters. And, but this is a Christian family. Now, I want today to study how, how the family can not only survive, but prosper in a fallen world. Go back with me to verse 1. Remember what God asked him? Why are you so mad? Adam knew his wife. She conceived. And she bore Cain. And she said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again. And this time, his brother Abel. Now, Abel was the keeper of the sheep. Cain was the tiller of the ground. But did you know it, it says it more graphically than that in the Hebrew language? I want you to listen to this for just a minute. In chapter 4, it, it says it where we can understand it just a little bit better, just out of the original language. And, and, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and she bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man, Jehovah. And she continued to bear his brother Abel. And she continued to bear his brother Abel. Now, look with me in verse 1. Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. One time. Conception. One time. One conception. And then in, in verse 1 and 2, and she bore. And in verse 2, she continued to bear. One conception, two bears. These guys were twins. Now, I thought maybe I was just nuts. You know, um, I've never even heard that, and I've been preaching a long time. So I dug out some commentaries, and did you know that Matthew Henry, how many of you have ever heard of Matthew Henry, the, the great preacher and commentator? He even says this. He said, I think these guys were twins. I thought, yeah, I knew it. These guys were twins. Not only did he kill his brother, he killed his twin brother. That's even worse. They had been together since birth. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and she bore Cain, and, and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. And in the Hebrew, it says it this way, I have acquired, I have received a man-god. It says, I have received a man, eth, Jehovah. And the word eth always means the essence of in the Hebrew. We don't even translate it. It means the essence of. It's, it's kind of hard to put your finger on what it really means, 
And so we don't even translate it into the English because it would take so many words to translate that little Hebrew word, eth, but it means the essence of. And she says, I have, I have acquired a man, essence of Jehovah, literally, essence of Yahweh. She said, I've acquired a man God. Now, why would she say something like that? I mean, that's kind of weird. How many of you have ever had your firstborn child and think, oh, I've got a, a man God here? Well, in chapter 3, while everybody's standing there, there's Adam, there's Eve, and there's Satan. God says in verse 15 to Satan, chapter 3, verse 15, God says to Satan, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He's talking to Satan. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to send a Savior. And it's going to be from Eve's children. And he's going to stomp your head. So the first child that Eve has, she said, that's him. That's him. That's the guy that's going to get Satan. What she didn't realize is that we were going to live in a fallen world with all of this sin for all these years until Christ came. But she looks at this and she said, that's the guy right there that God was talking about, my firstborn child. That's him. That's the, that's the man God. Now... When Jesus came, he was the God-man. Now, if we're going to live our family's lives in a fallen world, the first thing that we've got to know is that salvation comes from God, not from us. It's going to come from the God-man. It's not going to come from the man-God. Salvation is not going to come out of my heart and reach up to God and say, Oh, I found you. It's going to be that I live in a fallen world and I'm a broken person and God's going to reach down and he's going to get me in my sin. And the, he sent Jesus, his son, the, the, the God-man, to rescue me. Listen, God has a plan for your family and God has a plan for your life. And if you've got a plan for your family and you've got a plan for your life and you haven't included God in on it, it's going to go bad for your family. If you want to win and you want to succeed and you want to have a godly family in a fallen world, the first thing we've got to learn is we've got to find out what God's plan is for me and my family. And it's not the man God. It's the God man. And there's not anything that I can do by myself to make my family better. In fact, the harder I try to make my family better and the harder I try to save my kids, the more I'm going to lose them. The more you try to save your kids without God's help, the more you're going to push them away. And the harder you try, the further they're going to get. Until he came to the point that he killed his twin brother. And we think, my goodness, how did this happen? Well, how, did, how does it not happen? And what we've got to understand is that God has a plan for my life. God has a plan for our family's life. And Lord, what is it? Because it's much better than what you could ever dream up. And so here we go, twin brothers, the God-man, and she continued to bear, verse 2, and this time his brother Abel. Abel means vanity. It means breath. It means vanity. And she has the first one, and she said, there's the spear. There's the spear. There's the warrior. And then she has Abel, and she goes, oh, and there's vanity. And actually, it was just the opposite of that. Abel was a keeper of sheep, Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And that's literally what it says. He brought his offering to the Lord. Now, here we come to number two. First thing we've got to do is find out what God's plan is. We've got to be seeking God's plan, not our plan. Spending all our time looking for God's plan, not my plan. But number two... We've got to figure out what in the world is personal worship and how to have it at home. Personal worship and how to have it at home. So here we go. Verse 4. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. Literally, it means of their best. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. 
What in the world was the difference? Well, it's going to be found in the Hebrew language. And in verse 4 is missing something, if you will. The translation of verse 4 is just a little bit too shy of what we need here. It says, Abel also brought of the first fruit of his flock and of their fat. But in the Hebrew language, it says, Abel brought himself with his offering. And it literally says, he brought himself with his offering. It doesn't say that with Cain. And this is the difference. Abel brought, verse 4, Abel also brought himself with the first fruit, firstborn of his flock. You can read it this way. Abel brought of the first fruit and also himself of their best. So Abel brought himself and he brought his offering and he gave it to God. Cain brought his offering. You know, in the New Testament, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, he said, I want you to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And what Cain did was he brought a sacrifice, but he didn't bring himself. When he gave his offering to God, he didn't give himself to God. He just brought him an offering. When Cain came, I'm sorry, when Abel came, he brought himself with his offering. Now, what you're watching here is personal worship, not public worship. We're going to get to that in just a minute. God's going to start with worship, and he's going to end with worship. He's going to start, if you will, with private worship and end with public worship. But in verse 4 here, this is personal worship. This is worship at home. This is what we're missing in today's society. This is what Adam and Eve were missing. This is what Cain was missing. Now, Adam and Eve may have taught him this, but he didn't practice this. Cain didn't practice it. Abel practiced it. This is what we're missing in our homes in this world. And this is what's going to keep our homes pure and functioning, exciting, fun, and successful. This is the personal worship that Abel brought to God. Now, it even gets better than this. Abel also brought himself and the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, of their best. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. He had respect unto Abel and his offering. In your English versions, it says unto. In the Hebrew, it says el. E-L. Now, you know that E-L means el ohim. But there's two L's in the Old Testament. One of them means L God, and one of them means L intimate. They're spelled the same way. They have two different meanings. One of them is L Elohim, Almighty God, and one of them is L, and it means intimacy. And this is the word intimacy. The Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. And this means intimacy. Abel brought himself and his worship, and God had respect intimately with Abel. But with Cain, he did not have respect unto. There was no intimacy there. There was no giving of himself. There was some worship. There was a sacrifice. But Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, yeah, you're sacrificing. This is just what Cain did. But I want you to go learn something. I want you to go learn that I require mercy. The word is loving kindness. We translate it mercy sometimes. The, the New American Standard translates it loving kindness. I want you to go and learn what this means. I desire loving kindness and not sacrifice. We need that in our homes. We need that loving kindness from our hearts. We need to give God ourselves in our homes. We're going to talk about how to do that in just a minute. This is the difference. He brought a, uh, Cain brought the first fruit of what he did. Abel brought the first fruit of what he did. That's what they were supposed to do. That was the commandment. But the difference was Abel brought himself. 
And this is private worship. This isn't public worship. This is what we're missing in the home. Mama used to play the piano in the homes, and everybody would gather around the piano and sing the hymns. We don't do that anymore. Now, we live in a fallen world that unless we do something, unless we counterattack, we're going to lose. Because we live in a fallen world. And when, when Adam sinned, according to the Scriptures, he let Satan and all his armies into this earth. And it's a tough place to live. And if you do nothing... Nothing will happen except it gets worse. So we've got to do something. We've got to do something or it's going to get worse. It'll get worse in your homes. It'll get worse in your kids. It got worse in Adam and Eve's home. It got worse in Cain's home. We've got to do something. What we're missing is this private worship. Now listen, this is going to be the key. You're not even going to be able to do correct public worship if you don't have private worship in your homes. Now, the key to this is intimacy with God. This is where we give ourselves to God, and God gives himself to us. How many of you know the story about Ruth and Boaz? Remember Ruth and Boaz? Okay, Boaz had done all these nice things for Ruth. He looked at Ruth and he said, Oh, hot dog, there's the girl for me. <laughs> and everywhere that, that Ruth went, Boaz made sure that somebody was taking care of her. And he gathered up all, she was gleaning out in his field, and he gathered up all his uh, farmers and he said, Listen, this girl's out here. This, I'm putting my name on this girl. This is my girl. Leave her alone. And they all said... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Boaz had just come back from the wars in Judges. That's why he wasn't married. He'd been off fighting. That's why he's an older guy. He'd been off the war for five years. He'd been in World War II for five years. He's just coming home. He wasn't married, but he was a hot dog. He's an older guy now, and all the younger guys have gathered up all the girls, and, and he didn't have anybody to marry in Bethlehem because it's kind of small. And then this beautiful girl comes along, and she's in his field. Boaz tells his guys, he said, hey, come here. Who is that? Well, I think her name's Ruth. She married him? No, nah, she's gleaning. She's not married him. Wow. Don't want anybody touching her. Tell you what, guys. As you're going along, just take some of that stuff and just start throwing it on the ground. They said, excuse me? He said, just throw that stuff on the ground that you're... You're harvesting. Make sure she gets everything she needs. So these guys are chop, chop, chopping, and then throw some on the ground. Chop, 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 and they throw some on the ground. She doesn't know it. But he's taking care of her before he ever met her. Now this is a picture of God. This is a picture of Jesus. And he's taking care of us before we ever met him. And he thinks you are his. Now, the end of the story of Ruth and Boaz is, is Ruth's mother-in-law tells her, she said, you know, you're not married and this guy's in love with you. And Ruth said, oh, no, he couldn't be in love with me. And, and Ruth's mother-in-law said, oh, baby, he's giving your money. He's giving his money away to you. He's taking care of you. He's got to be in love with you. I'll tell you what I want you to do. He's going to be harvested. He's going to be so exhausted at the end of the day. I want you to go and I want you to lay down next to him crossways perpendicular to his feet and just uncover his feet and so she did that and it got real cold that night and he woke up because his feet were cold that's why i got married i went to bed every night with cold feet he wakes up and there's this woman down there at the end of his feet he said who are you she said i'm ruth would you marry me Now, he's sort of asleep till then. That'll bring you right out of a cold sleep. Would you marry me? <laughs> Throw your blanket over me. Let's get married. He said, ooh, baby, baby, baby. Yes. 
Now, there's going to be some conditions to this. I'm going to have to work some of this stuff out, but I'll get it done. Yes, yes, I will. That is intimacy. That is where we give ourselves to God because we trust Him. Girls, would you ever go ask somebody to marry you that you didn't absolutely trust and knew he was going to say yes? Well, I got news for you, girls. Guys, would you ever ask a girl to marry you if you didn't trust her and know she was going to say yes? I don't want anybody telling me no. Who's that? Oh, that's the guy that's been turned down five times. This is the intimacy that this is talking about right here. He, Abel, gave himself to God. He trusted God and he gave himself there and he came and he said, God, would you please have me? And God said, yes. Now that's what we need in our homes. This is where we give ourselves to God we uncover ourselves before God. Guys, if you want your wife to know who you really are, you talk to God with her. You pray with her. This is where a husband and a wife come together and they pray together. And you've got intimacy with God and you've got intimacy with each other. This is where you're bearing your soul to God and you're bearing your soul to each other. And this is where we give ourselves to God and God has intimacy with us. This is private home worship. This is where we come together and we... We read our Bibles together, and we sing praises together. We need the worship back in the homes. We must have the worship back in our homes. If we don't have the private worship back in our homes, we will never get this country for God. You will never get your kids for Christ. This is Adam and Eve, and these are believers. This is Cain, who was raised in a Christian home. Now, let's keep going. Let's keep going. So, number one... We, we need God's plan for our life. Not our plan, but God's plan. Number two, we need worship, private, intimate worship in our homes where we read the Bible and we pray and we sing our songs and we just give ourselves to God. We go nuts with our kids. If you want to uncover yourself before God and be intimate with God, you just tell a Bible story and be stupid when you do it when you're telling your kids. You got a butter knife running around chopping off Goliath's head. Ew. You hold his head up. Ew. Drip, 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 drip. You become open to Christ. When you do, you become open to God. You become open to your family. But number three, there's a big fight in our homes and in our lives. Verse 5, Cain was very angry. His countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your personality changing? If you do well, will you not be accepted? The word accepted is exalted. Successful, if you do well, will you not be Exalted, successful, well, healed, blessed. If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Now this is number three. Do well. The word well means to please God. To do what God wants. Franklin Graham, in his book, where he talks about being a re rebel, he says on, on his 22nd birthday, his mom and dad had taken him up to, I think it was Lausanne, Switzerland, up to the lake. And Billy and Franklin were walking beside the lake. And Billy turns to Franklin and he said, Franklin, I sense that there's a great struggle within your life. God is wanting you and you're going to have to make a decision are you going to follow God for the rest of your life or are you not you must make a decision Franklin said he went home that was on his birthday his 22nd birthday he said he went home for two weeks I struggled with that thought about that 
And he said, in two weeks, I accepted Christ as my Lord and as my Savior, and I yielded myself and I gave myself over to God. I made the decision. Here's the decision right here. Cain's very angry. Cain's the rebel. Cain's got this struggle, and he's got this fight inside of him, and he's going to have to make a decision. Now, we're the same way. Our kids are the same way. We're angry people. And we're going to have to make a decision. Are we going to follow Jesus or are we not? And if we're going to follow Jesus, we must forgive. And he will help us do that. But we must forgive. Now, that doesn't mean sometimes... Listen carefully to this. Now, hang on just a minute. I want to backtrack just a second. Wives, if you're living with an abusive husband, you need to get out. I'm not telling you to go back. Forgiveness oftentimes means a lot more than just going back. You should not go back. If you're living with an abusive husband, do not go back. They will kill you. This is not what I'm saying. This is not what God's saying. When we talk about forgiveness, there's two kinds of forgiveness. There's two words in the Bible for forgiveness. One is charizomai and one is ephemi. Charizomai means unconditional forgiveness. Charizomai means that unconditionally you have to forgive them. But that means you shouldn't keep a grudge. That means that you can't keep a grudge all your life because it will ruin your life. But there's another word that's a me, and that means conditional forgiveness. And this is the word of how you get into heaven. This is the word forgiveness, how you get to heaven. If you accept Christ and repent of your sins, you can go to heaven. And if you don't, you can't get in the house. This is conditional forgiveness. I'm afraid a lot of Christians don't know about this. This says, God says, if you love me and will accept me, there's some conditions here, and you will repent of your sins, then you can come live in my house. But if you don't, you can't come live in my house. And that's the same way it is down here. If you're living with an abusive husband, now if he repents and gives his life to God and changes, then... He can live in your house, but if he doesn't, he can't live in your house. That's just what God said. Do you understand this? But here God says to Cain, you've got, an, you've got this horrible conflict inside of you, and you're a pretty angry guy, and you're not who you used to be. Things have changed. And if you do well, this means to do what God wants. This means to give your life to God. This means to tell God, I'm going to follow you and I, whatever you tell me, I'll do it. And here's what Jesus said. You have to love your brother, you have to forgive your brother. That means you can't hold a grudge against him. That means you can't be racist. But that doesn't mean you have to let him back in your house. Do you, do you understand? And here's what he's telling you. You've got to make a decision. We've got to make a decision today. Today. After you hear this, are we going to worship God in our homes and have private worship with our families? Are we going to give ourselves to God? Are we going to follow God's plan for our lives? It's never too late to start today. And today's what we're going to start with. There's a fight going on inside of you. Do you want to give yourselves to Christ? Are we going to give our homes and our families to Christ? Are we going to follow our plan? Are we going to follow our jobs? Are we going to be too busy for our families? Are we too busy for God? Or are we going to give ourselves to God? And it, are we going to give our homes to Christ? Are we going to have private worship? You may not can play the piano, but you can gather together and sing a few courses. Uh, we've got some hymn books in here. I'd love for you to take a hymn book and go home if you're actually going to sing it. And start family worship in your homes. And here, there's a decision that's got to be made. 
we've got a lot of angry Christians. And it's because God said to Cain, why are you so angry? If you do well, you're going to be exalted. If not, sin's desires for you. Lastly, in verse 26, As for Seth, see Adam and Eve had another son to replace Abel. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And then men began to call on the name of the Lord, and that's public worship. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. They started having public worship. They started having church together. This is important. It's important that you come to church. It's important that you meet with other believers. In fact, the Bible says that it's commanded. Let us consider one another to provoke into love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Whoever wrote Hebrews, he commands us, God commands us to worship publicly, and we get together, and that's a commandment. In fact, it's one of the ten commandments. And we worship, but it's hard to worship publicly if you haven't been worshiping privately. And public worship is just to teach us how to do private worship. That's what it is. And God says, if you want to do that, if you want your families to just go crazy for Jesus and you want to be happy, you want to be exalted, and you want to be excited, then do this. Okay, now, I cannot leave this chapter without looking at one other thing. The mark of Cain. The question that you all came for today to know what it is. The mark of Cain. Well, it was a black marker that God took and he wrote right across... No, no, no. Okay, so let's take a look. If you'll bear with me for just a minute. In chapter 4, verse 15, The Lord said, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, God says, Because you've killed your brother, I'm going to curse the earth because of you. I'm going to curse the ground because of you. And it's not going to bear anything for you at all. You're a farmer, but it's just not going to work. And, and Cain says, oh, I can't. This is too hard for me. I can't stand it. And anyone who sees me is going to kill me. And God says, okay, I'm going to put a mark on you so they don't kill you. Now, what would be the mark that God would put on Cain to keep other people from killing him? And I tell you what it was. It's in the Scriptures. It's giantism. He developed giantism. Now, remember in chapter 6 of Genesis, there were giants in those days and also afterwards? And this is going to be a genetic code that God puts into Cain. Everybody's not going to be giants in his group, but all the giants come from his side of the family in the Bible. He puts giantism on him so that when people see him, they're not going to go, oh, I think I'll kill him. They all look like a Goliath and go, <laughs> and run away. But... There were giants in the earth in those days, and also afterwards, after what? After the flood. Genesis chapter 6, after the flood. How did the giants get from before the flood to after the flood? Because everybody was killed in the flood except those on the boat. Well, Ham brought it over with his wife in the genetics. Remember Ham? The not-so-good godly kid? Well, guess who he married? The not-so-good godly wife. How do I know that? Because that's what the whole world was doing. And God had to destroy the whole world to get that stopped. He brought it over on the ark in his genetics, in her genetics. And you've got this giantism. Where did the giantism come from? The Bible doesn't say. Yeah, it does. It's right here. Now, what you've always wanted to know, I just told you. Okay, we've got to stop. Some of you are having a tremendous struggle in your life. You're trying to decide, is all this Jesus stuff real or not? What do I need to do so I can be happy? And what we're studying about, what we've heard, and what we sing about, is that Jesus can forgive you of all your sins. Jesus can get you to heaven, but much more than that. Jesus can make you 
acceptable to God today. Jesus can make you happy. Jesus can save you, and Jesus can save your family. Jesus can save your kids. If you want to give your life to him. Some of you are struggling not with that. You're Christians already, but you're struggling with your home life, and your families, your husbands, and your wives, and you're angry. You're dissatisfied. Jesus can fix that if you'll let him. He can help you forgive everything and everyone. That doesn't mean you've got to go back and live with them. God's not so stupid as to send you back into there. But you can't hold a grudge. It will eat you up. You know what happens when you hold a grudge? Watch this. Phil, stand up just a minute. All right. Here's me and here's Phil. And Phil has been very ugly to me over the years. <laughs> and I'm mad at him. And because I've got this grudge, I've got a chain around my neck, and he's holding it in his hand. And every time I get away from him, he jerks that chain! Pulls me back, because I'm connected with him. But when I tell God, Lord, you help me to forgive them. I'm, they're not going to come back into your life. You don't have to worry about that. But you've got to forgive there because otherwise that change always goes. I start to pull away. Oh, he pulls me back. And I get really angry at him again. And it, he, every time he moves, it affects me. But when I chop that chain, and that's what Jesus is talking about, forgiving, I'm free. Martin Luther King said it best. I'm free. Thank God I'm free. Jesus has set me free. Okay, you can be seated, hateful. Thank you, brother. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And he loves you. Listen. I don't what I don't care what mankind tells you. He loves you if you're Baptist. He loves you if you're Catholic. He loves you if you're Church of Christ. He loves you if you're Episcopalian. He loves you if you're Jewish. Jesus loves me. This I know. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Believe means to receive. If you would like to receive Christ today, God's invitation is open. Would you let Him change you? Would you let him save you? Would you let him take your anger away? Would you let him take that fallen personality and make you a different kind of person? You won't lose your identity. It'll just be a better identity. Alan Burkhalter, when he accepted Christ, did not lose his identity. He just became a better Alan Burkhalter. Not perfect. Just saved. If you'd like to do that today, God's invitation is open. We're going to stand and we're going to sing for just a moment.